Today we are going to be looking at Matthew chapter 4 and on the Christian calendar it's now the first Sunday in Lent and it would have been Ash Wednesday on Valentine's Day and we are preparing ourselves now for this time where we're getting ready for Easter and every Sunday towards that time of great celebration. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 4, and we will be reading from verse 1 to 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him into the holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and their hands shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him to an exceeding high mountain and they showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All these things I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil left him and behold angels came and ministered unto him here ends the reading of god's word lord today as we look to your word we thank you for this moment that we have as you will encourage us in your word lord you've encouraged us with the songs that we've sung unto you as we praised you in adoration for who you are and Lord, as we look to this word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes that we may see and open our ears that we may hear. And that all of us today will be blessed, God. And that your Holy Spirit will move within our lives and within the service as you've already started to. We give you all the praise and all the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. So today from this text, we see that Jesus is being tested by the devil. And we can visualize this scene where Jesus, in the previous chapter, just at the end of chapter 3, has been baptized by John the Baptist. And he's been anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that he is full of the Holy Spirit. And he is by himself to discern his vocation now. He's now 30 years old, and he's going into the ministry. And he's face, face to face with his opponent, who we just heard is the devil. And he ultimately wants Jesus to abandon his true calling. So the question facing this episode is, will Jesus wisely discern and then faithfully obey the vocation that God has set before him. This is what we will see today. So I share with you the title of this message, Success in the Wilderness. Success in the Wilderness. So here is Jesus now. He is in the wilderness. I don't know how many of you have experienced a wilderness, like a physical wilderness. But we have some examples here. The first one 
This is an example of the wilderness in Israel. I say the clouds are lovely. But just the fact that this is a wilderness with nothing but dirt, dust, rocks. There's nothing really happening here. And we can visualize that Jesus is in a place like this at this particular time. There's another photo here of a wilderness. It has more greenery. And this is a wilderness in the southwest of America. There's still nothing else here. There's no people, just the shrubbery and the plants. So we are going to envision that Jesus is in some place like this. Maybe the first more than the second, maybe. And we're given a lot of information here in the first two verses that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. He was guided by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He's not being led into the city. He's being led into the wilderness. And he didn't take himself there. It said he was led by the Spirit. And what is the purpose of Jesus being there? There is a specific purpose. He is to be tempted by the devil. And Luke says it a little different. As we know, every disciple gives a little difference in their account. But in Luke chapter 4, also in chapter 4, Luke says in verse 1 and 2, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when it, they were ended, he was very hungry. So Luke is actually letting us know, as the readers, that the testing was for these 40 days that Jesus was fasting. And he also tells us that Jesus ate nothing. Nothing. There's an ad that comes on the TV that says, hungry, grab a Snickers. No Snickers here. He had nothing. And Jesus was fasting for 40 days. The 40 days was symbolic of the 40 years of testing that the Israelites in the past experienced the wilderness as well. And then we look at another 40 days as Moses was in Mount Sinai, 40 days and 40 nights when God gave him the Ten Commandments. So now we're putting ourselves in the position of Jesus. Imagine how Jesus felt. You remember your last one day fast when we only had liquids and by 4 p.m. you were dying for 6 p.m. to come so you could eat something? Or how about the seven day fast, the Daniel fast, when on day three you had to keep telling yourself, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, this is for the sake of Jesus, for my miracle, I'm going to keep going. And we may have wanted to give up or we may not have wanted to give up. But here we can imagine Jesus who hasn't fasted for seven days or 14 days or 21 days. He's fasted for 40 long days. He is hungry. He is hungry. And he's been tested while being hungry. Physical hunger. How are we when we are hungry? A lot of us, when we're hungry, we get miserable, right? We're cranky. Boy, don't tell me nothing, I'm hungry. We're flustered. We might even get angry. And there was once a saying, I don't know if it's still true, they would say, a hungry man is an angry man. Is that still true? I don't know. And Jesus was hungry. And usually when we are hungry, we have to watch our emotions because... It's said that when we're either hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we have to watch our emotions for temptations. And for sure, Jesus had to be feeling at least one or two of these emotions because he was also human, not just Jesus the Great. But his body now was vulnerable to temptation. And even as we reflect on how we were when we were in our Daniel fast, we had a purpose. 
Our purpose was to draw closer to God without the distractions. And it was a chance for us to bring our desires to God in a quiet space, in unrushed moments, in order to hear his voice. So today I'm going to share with us three things that we learned from Jesus on our journey as we look to this text. The first one is we learn how to handle temptations. The second is we learn the importance of being obedient. And the third is we learn how to embrace the wilderness seasons in our life. So let's look at the first one, how we handle temptations. Let's first look at the meaning of the word to tempt. And according to the Barclays commentary, there is a Greek word for the word to tempt. I'll put it up here for you to see. It is pronounced terazine. But the meaning in English, the word tempt has an unformally and a consistently bad meaning because in an English version, it means to entice someone to do wrong or to seduce them to sin or to try to persuade them to take the wrong way. But in the Greek, the word temp is a different element. It tends to lean to mean tests, such as testing of character, which far, is far more than it means to tempt in the sense of the word that we know it. So in the English, it means to seduce people to do wrong. But in the Greek, it means to test and to test a person's character. Because this same word, parazine, is used in the story of Abraham sacrificing his son, Isaac. And Isaac is not being seduced by any way, but God is testing Abraham of his loyalty because God would not make any man be a wrongdoer. So this same word, parazine, is used for the testing of loyalty to God. So we're looking also at the word, the tempter. The tempter is evil, who is the devil or the enemy. And the aim of the tempter is to penetrate evil in the world and in our lives. So the job of the devil is to tempt us and to test us in many ways. And now we are seeing if we will pass the test when that happens. So in the natural realm, all of us go through tests. We go through tests at school, as you will remember those days that you were at school. Your parents or your guardians would encourage you to prepare for your tests. They would tell you to study so that you can pass your tests or pass with flying colors. And it was always our aim as students to pass with flying colors. Most students want to pass with flying colors. And then somewhere along the line when you get near UE maybe, if you get there, you just want to pass because the work is so hard. But most of us want to A. And in our situation, spiritually, Jesus shows us how to pass and how to pass with flying colors, how to handle temptations. And Jesus is saying he has empowered us to handle our tests victoriously. So Jesus had three tests back to back here in this text. And I know personally that I don't want three back to back tests. I don't know if you would, but let's look at the test together. The first test he deals with is his fidelity to God, his love, his loyalty to Almighty God. And the devil comes and he says to him, if you really are the son of God, command that these stones here on this ground be made into bread, if you are the son of God. And the devil is focusing on Jesus' sonship in this test. He's trying to cast doubt into Jesus' mind. I know I am the son of God. I was just baptized and the dove came down and God said, this is my beloved son. So I know that I am the son of God. But this if really means since. Since you are the son of God. 
And the enemy tends to do the same thing to us sometimes. He tries to get us to doubt the promises of God. Because he knows that Jesus is hungry. And he knows when we have moments of weakness as well. When we are hungry, whether it is emotionally or psychologically. And Jesus, we all know, must have been dying to eat something. As we learned that he was very hungry. And Jesus says to him in response, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We should not live by bread alone. If we take that moment and we think about bread and how awesome it tastes when it is freshly baked, I can imagine, just imagine for a moment, Jesus seeing those stones on the ground with the ability to change them into bread. And he doesn't do it because he's saying, I rather remember that it's God's word that gives sustenance. The word of God is our bread. So the focus of this first test is rather Jesus' reliance upon God's provision. And he refuses to serve his own need because his need would have been, let me get something to eat now. He could have been satisfied with his own need at that time, but he chose not to. He chose to trust in God's gracious provision and remain faithful to God. And when we look at this in the spiritual sense, we know what bread does. It fills us up. You know, when we go to the restaurant, before we actually get the meal we're going to order, they bring us bread, right? And water. But they bring us a lot of bread, so much so that by the time we get our main course, we say to our friends or whoever we go to eat with, man, I can't get this if we don't no eat. The bread fill me up. Because that's what bread does. It fills us up. And Jesus wants us to see that when we consume the word of God, we are guaranteed to be filled as well. Because God's word, when we chew on his word, we are filled with more of him. The psalmist says that, God's words are sweeter than honey, and they're better than gold. Isn't that a nice example? Like we can't even fathom that God's word could really be better than gold, and gold costs so much money in, in the store. And honey is such a sweet element to have. So this is what the word of God is being shown to us as an example. Let's look at the second test. The second test is in verse 5 to 7. The devil takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. So there's a temple and he takes him to the top of it. And the devil is also using scripture this time. He wants to entice Jesus with scripture. So now he is saying, it is written that if you... It is written that he will give his angels charge over you. He is now using the word of God because he wants to show that the devil himself knows the word of God. The devil uses the words from Psalms 91 verse 11 to 12 where the scripture promises that God will protect those he loves and those who put their trust in him. But what would have happened if the son of God threw himself off the pinnacle of the temple just to see what would happen. This would have been a drastic rescue by the angels. But Jesus responds again by refusing to put God to the test. He says it. He says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus responds by refusing to put God to the test. And Jesus succeeds where in the past Israel would have failed. And he says, you are not to put God to the test. We quickly look at the third one, where the devil now takes him to the highest mountain in verse 9. Verse 8 and verse 9, he tells him to fall down and worship me. The devil offers Jesus political authority over all the nations. 
and the honor that goes with it. Can you imagine this? The devil is claiming that he has authority. He's claiming that he has the authority that has been handed to him and he has the power to do whatever. But this is a lie. Because the devil is what? He is the father of lies. And the same verb that is used here is used in Deuteronomy chapter 7, which refers to God's promise to give. And he gives the nations to Israel as they prepare to enter the land. But here the devil is offering a promise that really isn't his. He's given a false promise. The source of genuine authority in the world is not for the devil, it's for God. And Jesus responds. His response is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, you shall not bow down to the Lord your God, and you will worship him only. Jesus blocks this test by the devil successfully with scripture, and he also rebukes him. And we can sometimes fall into that trap of accepting the lies of the devil. Sometimes he comes and he tells us lies about people and he tells us lies about things. And we need to do the same thing that Jesus did. We need to rebuke him in Jesus' name. And we learn from Jesus here that as the devil is asking him to bow before him and worship him, that Jesus shows us that true worship must be only given to God and God alone, especially during times of temptation. So we should refrain from idols, whether material things or otherwise. God must be the only one that is worshipped. So Jesus shows us here that there is power in Scripture to turn away temptation because every single temptation, Jesus responds, it is written. Those three times, he powerfully combated the, em the enemy. And he shows us the importance of memorizing scripture and meditating on scripture. Even the psalmist David said in Psalms 119 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. He hid it in there. You know how it is when you hide something from somebody, you don't want anybody to get to it. You hide money or you hide your jewelry. You hide it because you don't want them to get to it. So we're hiding the word inside our hearts so that we would not sin against the Lord. Jesus is also teaching us how we should use our sword. This is our sword. This is our sword. You ever remember watching a movie where people are learning to use a sword. They're practicing their swing. They're practicing how to go down, how to go left, and how to go right. They're practicing their stand. They're practicing different ways that they should use their sword in that stand. And they're practicing their sword swing because the main goal is for them to get good so that when the enemy comes for battle, they can beat them and they can win. So it's the same with us. We have to be able to confidently declare the word of God when we meditate on it, when we learn to use our sword. What good is a sword if you don't learn to master it? What good is the sword that someone is standing in front of you also with a sword and they cut you up? So you take time to practice using your sword, how to go in and how to go out. That's what we need to do. So we need to take one or two verses a week and say, I will master my sword so that when the enemy comes, we can overcome him from the tests that he brings. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says, there's no temptation that has come except that it's coming to man, that God is faithful. He will not let us, he will not let you, he will not let me be tempted above, beyond what we can bear. But when you are tempted, listen to this, he will also make a way out so that you can endure it. He'll make a way out and escape. This, brothers and sisters, is a promise. 
It is a promise of protection and it is a promise of provision. God is providing an escape in the tests that we go through every day and every week, which means that you don't really need to ask God for two minutes to cuss off the body that just upset you. You don't have to indulge in that sin that you struggle with. All we need to do is ask God to show us the escape for that moment so that we can use it. We say, Lord, show me the escape for this situation today and please help me to use it. I know that when we were in school, if anybody said anything to us or did anything to us or they cuffed us, they would say, cuff it back, man, cuff it back. You can take that, you soft, man. Or you have the other voice saying, no joy, that body ain't worth it. Let me keep moving. Don't stoop to them level. Let me keep moving. And that, brothers and sisters, is the escape. That is the escape. Keep moving. Don't stoop to the level of the other person. Keep moving. They're not worth it. And your Christianity is not worth it. The Holy Spirit is there for us. That we can say, Holy Spirit, help me now. Empower me afresh. That I will make the right moves. That I will say the right things even now. And there's more good news. The more good news is that the Spirit helps us in our times of infirmities. When we don't know what to pray, the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings, Ugh, groanings that cannot be uttered. And the Spirit makes intercession for us. That's good news. He makes intercession for the saints according to God's will. Brothers and sisters, God, Jesus wants us to win. So he also uses scripture as a shield. Jesus has the scripture now as a shield. He's using the sword and the shield to block and to swipe the things that the enemy brings to us. That's how we need to use the word of God. The second thing is the importance of being obedient. In all the tests, Jesus could or he could, he could have yielded. Remember Luke said that he was full of the Holy Spirit. He had just come from being baptized. But he was obedient to the direction of the Spirit. He followed. And when I thought about this, of Jesus following the Spirit, I thought about when we were small and we were going to play games and our friends would say, come man, come, come with me, come. And you follow them. You're excited to follow and to play. And here is Jesus excitedly, probably, following the Holy Spirit because he wants to follow God's will for his life. And we must ask God to give us a heart to follow the Holy Spirit. It is not always easy, but it is worth it. We must ask God for the heart to follow the Holy Spirit so that when the tests and the difficulties come and we don't know what to do, we will rely fully on him. One Christian theologian, Charles Stanley, said in a devotion, God's goal is to develop our endurance and our faith so that when he does so by creating situations where we have no choice but to turn to him. And we are encouraged that nothing happens without God's permission. I know that's not always nice to know, but when we think about it, God is giving us tests to test our loyalty. So the question is, will we remain faithful to God or will we cave in and follow our own lusts and our ways? We must decide to be obedient and faithful to God instead of diverting to our own selfish ways. It's up to us too. Satan's aim is to hinder us and our church from following Jesus and from being obedient. But brothers and sisters, once again, God's desire is for us to win. So the third thing that Jesus teaches us in this text is to embrace the wilderness season. When I first thought about this, I said it can't be easy at all. When we look at the pictures of the wilderness, the wilderness is lonely. It is a place that tends to be dry and barren 
and if it's green and it has plant life, it's still lonely. But the purpose of the wilderness for us as Christians is to humble us. We all need more humility. And Jesus went to the wilderness to be alone. His task had come to him. He was going to be prepared for the next thing. God had just brought him from being baptized, and now he was preparing him for his ministry. And he shows us the importance of making time to be alone with God, alone for direction, alone for upliftment, alone to be empowered for the task ahead of us. 40 days in the wilderness. It's almost six weeks. That's not easy. Sit and think about that. Imagine if any of us could handle 40 days alone, without TV, no radio, no YouTube, no Netflix, no cell phone, no fast food, no laptop, no computer, no tablet, no family, no friends. <gasps> Just alone. We would go crazy. I admit, I would. I think I would go crazy. Um, but we all need to spend time alone in solitude. It may not be 40 days, but like on Saturday mornings, we could wake up early for solitude, or Friday night, or early mornings at the end of the day. You choose. But solitude should be included in our Christian walk as a spiritual practice to embody the presence of God on a personal level. In the wilderness is where we should worship God and ask him for the heart to sing in the midst of our circumstances while he's preparing us for that special place. In that quiet time, he's preparing us and Jesus was being prepared for his ministry and so are we. The wilderness cultivates us and it has benefits of living out our faith. Our souls need constant cultivating and sometimes in the wilderness of our lives, even though it is dry, sometimes we can have those moments that are filled with sorrow and grief and tears, but we can be reassured that God is with us because he promised never to leave us nor forsake us. God ministered to David in the wilderness. That's how he wrote half of these Psalms in this Bible. God ministered to Moses in the wilderness when he encountered the burning bush that wasn't consumed. And God ministered to the Israelites in the wilderness as he provided manna with a cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. In the wilderness, God is our provider. God is our sustainer. God is our protector in the wilderness. And at the end of the test, you will notice in verse 11, it said that the devil left him. Jesus rebuked him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. And the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. We should be willing to open ourselves to the Holy Spirit while in our wilderness and be like Jesus, allowing angels to minister to our heart. So I say to us today, brothers and sisters, we have a lot to learn from these tests of Jesus today that we can be successful. But if you are here today and you aren't saved, you know what? You have no defense against the temptations in life. You are alone with temptations. But if you accept Jesus today, you will have a defense and protection from Almighty God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's our, our encouragement to you today, to accept Jesus, to have this defense and this protection that can only be obtained through Jesus Christ. And as followers of Jesus Christ, once you follow Jesus, you have the defense in the midst of temptations. We have his word and we have his Holy Spirit inside of us. The unsaved doesn't have the Holy Spirit, you know, but we have that extra superpower. And the Lord, brothers and sisters, once again, he wants us to win. So let us resolve to get into God's word, to know the voice of God, 
in order to overcome the temptations and the tests as God's ultimate goal is for us to grow stronger in him, to rely on his Holy Spirit and to win the tests that we face in Jesus' name. Amen.